Everybody to take its places, please. So we continue with the second panel. That's right. <laughs> there they come. Am I sitting in the right place? Yeah. Hello, Kenneth. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Very fine. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll start with our uh, second panel, which is challenges and opportunities for shell gas. Uh, the reform is not only related to uh, oil or Pemex. Uh, it's energy in the whole contest, as uh, George said at the beginning uh, this morning. And, and, and shell gas is very important. Shell has, has been, uh, uh, it's a competition between CFE and Pemex to do uh, shell gas, and, and they're being uh, working on it. You've heard about Los Ramones and other pipelines that have been uh, publicly bid in Mexico. But I'll leave all those uh, things about shell gas to our three panelists. And we'll follow the same format that we did for the first panel. We'll have remarks from the th three panelists and then I got some questions and, and please, after that, feel free to uh, make your comments and questions. First on uh, my left is uh, Luis Miguel Labardini. He is a partner of Marcos Asociados, Infraestructura y Energía since uh, 1995. He's been in charge of multiple transactions uh, uh, regarding energy. Between 1990 and 1995, Luis was a senior advisor for the chief financial office, uh, officer of Pemex and led the negotiations for a $200 billion U.S. Exim Bank Guarantee Program to uh, finance the fields of San, Malob, and Khan. He was also uh, working for the Ministry of Finance as Undersecretary of Trade and Financing and also a technical underdirector of foreign investment. During the 1988-1989, uh, during the last part of the restructuring of the Mexico public debt, he led the creation of the so-called Brady Bonds. Uh, he was a Fulbright Fellow between 1985 and 1987 and he has his MA in International Economics from Yale and also has a Master in Management from MIT. His thesis in MIT is Investment Decisions in the Mexican Petroleum Industry. Thank you, Luis Miguel. No, wherever you want. You want to stay here or you want okay, to come yeah, I'll stay here. Okay, good. Uh, good morning. I, I, I'm, I'm very honored to be here with you at the Baker Institute and, and with, with such a, an interesting crowd. And I'm sure that uh, we're going to come up with uh, very interesting ideas about what's going to happen to Mexico in the near future. Uh, there are two, two, I, two things that I would like to stress uh, that, are, that should guide uh, uh, the discussion about shale gas. One of them is the fact that, that uh, uh, between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, there is, uh, there is a, a, a giant in terms of shale gas. Uh, each of these countries has a recoverable, technically recoverable uh, reserves uh, as per a recent study by the uh, Energy Information Administration. Uh, each country has about 150 TCF of uh, technically recoverable reserves in, in shale, shale gas. Uh, this makes this region the, 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 the most important region by far in the world in terms of shale gas. And this means a lot to Mexico because as it is already happening in the U.S., 
You know, the, the, the regions where shale gas is being developed uh, have experienced a renaissance in economic terms. Uh, the um, manufacturing sector in the U.S. has also experienced a renaissance because of, of, uh, of the fact that uh, uh, natural gas is uh, at, at historical lows in terms of price. And this is something that we would like to see in Mexico. Uh, Mexico is a, a net importer of natural gas. We are importing about 1.7 uh, million cubic feet per day right now. And uh, we should be exp importing more, but we have a problem in, in the infrastructure uh, that, that would bring more gas from the U.S. to Mexico. Actually, uh, some of the gas we have to import th by boat through Manzanillo uh, at a price of $22 uh, per million BTU compared with 3.5 of the gas that comes from the U.S. So one of the things that the Mexican government is doing right away is to increase the, the, the transportation uh, infrastructure to bring more gas from, uh, from, from the U.S. to Mexico. But uh, that doesn't sort out the, the, the main issue. The main issue is that Mexico is the, between the fourth and the sixth largest a, 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 a country with uh, technically recoverable uh, shale gas reserves, and uh, th this is this is very important because I, I think this is historical. This is something in Mexico we have always had something that changes the the game. We had Cantarell back in the late eighties. Uh, Cantarell, uh, you know, the government of Mexico lived out of Cantarell for more than 20 years. Then when Cantarell started declining, uh, a, a second field also in shallow waters called Kumalovsap uh, came into stream. And now Kumalovsap has basically made up for the lost production in Cantarell. <coughs> uh, Kumalovsap is producing about right now about 180,000 barrels per day. And now that, that Kumalovsap is going to start declining, we have uh, shell gas. This is something that we didn't know uh, two years ago. The first shell gas well uh, in shell uh, play well in Mexico was drilled back in 2010. And so far, Pemex has drilled only five wells. Only five wells. In 2012, Pemex drilled three wells in the US they drill about 10,000 wells. Uh, so is Pemex going to invest in shale gas in Mexico? The answer is no. And Froilán Gracia was mentioning it uh, this morning. Uh, Pemex will not invest in shale gas. Somebody else will have to do it. And the idea of the reform, the final idea of the reform is to bring to Mexico as many operators as possible to develop shale gas basins. How are we going to do it? That's something that is still to be done because the constitutional reform only talks about the changes in the constitution, but it doesn't say anything about well, it doesn't say anything about how to how to implement successfully a strategy to develop the shale gas basins. Um, Antonio de la Garza was talking about uh, the, the 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 Reforma Hacendaria en Materia Petrolera, which means a tax reform uh, regarding petroleum, which would be applied to, to Pemex. But uh, it, this could be extrapolated to, to the way that the Mexican government would deal with private operators. And I'm saying that Pemex will not uh, invest in, uh, in shale gas because Pemex has, it, Pemex portfolio has uh, a couple other investments that, that have an, an internal rate of return that is much, much higher than, than shale gas. This is shallow waters, still with Cantarell, with Kumalovsap, and some other new fields that are being developed uh, right now. Uh, uh, Shush, Ayatzil, Tekel, Tsimin. These fields are, being, are, are just being started to, uh, to develop, and all of this is in, in shallow waters. So Pemex truly has neglected investment in other areas that are very important. 
I mean, we think that Mexico is is uh, is the fourth largest country with technically recoverable uh, potential reserves, and and Pemex doesn't want to invest in shale gas because it just doesn't bring the returns uh, to equity that uh, that uh, shallow waters provides. Uh, Pemex has neglected also transportation, and uh, we can see that because we don't have enough uh, pipelines to bring uh, natural gas sh uh, coming from the U.S. to Mexico. So somebody else has to do it, and and in and the reform, uh, as I was mentioning, we see that uh, Pemex is talking about something called profit sharing agreement or profit sharing contract, and. Uh, what I've been hearing lately, in the last few days, is that that when when the actual bill is is discussed in uh, in the lower chamber and in the Senate in Mexico, uh, the PRI is going to perhaps open uh, its options and 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 uh, decide to go on together with with the with the PAN and say, well, you know. Perhaps the profit sharing agreements is not the best thing for sh uh, for shale gas per or shale oil. Perhaps what we need here is just a, a very simple license uh, uh, scheme that uh, that wouldn't put us through the uh, excruciating process of uh, of calculating the the the, the profit the profit oil f uh, in a profit sharing agreement. Uh, this makes sense. You know, the Mexican government has always been criticized because of its inability to collect taxes. So why would we think that now they're going to be successful if we're thinking that in the shale gas you, you have dozens of operators working all over the country? So it really makes sense to think about the, the possibility of using licenses instead of uh, profit, profit sharing agreements. Um, Pemex explained, I mean, the Ministry of Finance has explained very clearly what the profit sharing agreement means. Uh, and, and, and Antonio uh, mentioned, mentioned the main features of this, of this agreement. If finally this agreement is put in place, it has to be very, very simple for, for private operators to, uh, uh, to come over and invest in Mexico. Uh, because what we need in Mexico is precisely to develop this 550 TCF uh, of shale gas and, and a, a very large amount of, of shale oil too. Uh, the contractual, the institutional uh, framework is very important. Uh, and we have the advantage of being right next to the, the most important shale gas uh, player in the world, which is the United States. Uh, we have companies that have gone uh, up significantly through a learning curve, and it, it, it would just seem natural for this cluster that has developed in the U.S. to come down to Mexico, uh, to cross the border, because the border is, is just a, an artificial barrier that obstructs the, the efficient functioning of the markets. So if we had an open border, we, we would ne to, uh, if we would open the border tomorrow, we would have dozens of rigs coming down to Mexico to drill, not only for un unconventional place, but also for conventional place. And I think that has to be the final objective of the, of the reform, to open the border and to allow for the cluster to grow naturally from the U.S. to Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, we already have a... a, a an important uh, oil field service uh, industry. The main players are already there. They have bases in the main areas where, where shell plays are located. The, you know, the continuation of the Eagle Ford goes down to the Burgos Basin. And the Burgos Basin is already a, a pretty mature basin. You have, you have all service companies working there, all drilling contractors, service contractors. Uh, you do have the infrastructure, and and if you open the border, basically what you would have is something, something that I that I see, for instance, in Southeast Asia, and I would like to see in Mexico. Uh, you have operators uh, uh, supplying themselves in Singapore, but but uh, drilling in Indonesia or in Vietnam, uh, or all the way around. Uh, 
this is something that we should aspire to because that's when that if, if we achieve that stage in the industry we're going to have an optimum utilization of our of our capacities to develop our shale gas and shale oil resources uh, I, I must say that NAFTA did change the rules of the game back in the early 90s, because before NAFTA, Mexico was a very, very close country. Uh, only, only Mexican contractors were basically allowed to participate. And if a foreign company wanted to, to work in Mexico, they had to do it through, through a Mexican contractor. Not anymore. Also, you, have, you have most important contractors that work in the US, they also work in Mexico. And they've been working there for at least 15 years. So you already have there an infrastructure that you can use. And if you open the border, you would have even more contractors that, that would learn from the lessons learned of these contractors in the past. So well, th these are my, my remarks to begin with. Thank you. Thank you, Luis Miguel. Uh, now we're going to have uh, Professor Kenneth Medlock, which is a James Baker and Susan Baker fellow in energy and resources economics, and also the senior director of the Center of Energy Studies here in, in, in RICE. He is the, a principal in the development of the RICE World Natural Gas Trade Model. Uh, he teaches courses in energy and economics, supervises the PhD students, has received several awards, but one uh, uh, is the International Association for Energy Economics Award for the best paper of the year in 2001. So Kenneth, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, um, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, uh, the Baker Institute it really enjoys these kinds of exchanges because it helps really inform the policy discussions that go on in the halls here. And, uh, I think what we've seen so far today is putting a lot of fruit on that tree, and uh, I think we'll have some very rich discussions, not only today, but, but in, in, in the days to come. Uh, what I want to do is spend a few minutes sort of, you know, setting up the stage for, you know, why we're here talking about this. And, you know, a lot of times we just kind of focus on there's a massive reform potentially underway in Mexico and it's going to open up the sector and, you know, things are going to change. But we really have to think mechanistically about how that's going to happen. And I've heard some of that today so far. Um, in a lot of ways, though, as you'll see through the course of my remarks, I think some of these are kind of putting the proverbial cart in front of the horse um, because there are other issues at play that really need to be dealt with, uh, one of which, uh, which I'll come back to, that really hasn't been discussed at all today, and in every discussion I've seen around Mexican energy reform, it's never come up. It has to do with worker safety. So when you move south of the border, there are tremendous safety concerns associated with any type of development that, that is to occur. And so we hear a lot about opening the border, as was just actually discussed, and creating an environment that's a, that is attractive for foreign capital. And certainly that's what energy reform you know, sets the stage for. So it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Because there are a lot of companies that are active in the Eagleford Shale here in, 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 in the state of Texas. And we all, I think, are pretty well aware of the fact that the Eagleford Shale st extends well south of the border into the Borges and even the Sabinas Basins. It's a source rock for a lot of the production that's been already achieved in those particular areas. It's also not just a gas play. It's an oil play, too. Thermal maturity mapping that's been done associated with the ARI EIA assessments indicate that there's tremendous oil and liquids potential in that part of the part of the world as well. So if we extend the Eagleford South into Mexico, we've got a tremendous opportunity that lay before our feet. The trouble is the companies that are active north of the border have extreme reticence, even if energy reform were to pass, to send anybody south. This is a really important issue. <clears throat> And one of the things that perhaps it will do, energy reform that is, once it's actually seen that's not attracting the kind of activity that most people will hope to anticipate what they would see, at least onshore, is catalyze a renewed effort around security along the border. This is a really important issue, particularly if you want to attract Western companies to station people south of the border. Why do I say this? Because it was mentioned Pemex has you know, drilled five wells. Since the year 2000, in the Barnett Shale alone, there have been over 17,000 wells drilled. You have to drill a lot of wells when you're talking about a shale formation because each individual well makes very little contact with the rock around it. 
So you have to drill a lot of wells to fully characterize the resource. Once you learn, you get along that learning curve, you can then begin to zero on the so-called sweet spots. And that's exactly what's going on in every shale play in North America. So when we talk about shale development in Mexico, you have to recognize that not only is there a tremendous amount of capital that's needed to flow into the sector in Mexico, and so we need energy reform to occur there, you also need a tremendous amount of labor. You need a tremendous amount of equipment. You need a tremendous amount of service-oriented activity that just simply doesn't exist south of the border right now. It's a very different kind of mindset than what we're used to seeing with regard to conventional oil and gas production. So these are the kinds of issues I think that at the end of the day need to be brought to the surface and discussed because if energy reform is truly going to be successful onshore, these things need to be addressed and they need to be dealt with. Offshore I think is a completely different arrangement. Offshore, you've got tremendous resource that's in play, and I think, honestly, once you actually see the landscape change with regard to energy reform in Mexico, you will see capital attracted into that sector. The security concerns are diminished. It really is just about investing, about actually assessing the resource in place, about developing platforms that you can actually drill wells, have subsea tiebacks, and then move the oil to market. This is a very different kind of animal. I think that's probably where you're going to see the most success initially. Now, when we talk about resource, it's really important, and, and I've heard this a couple times already today, but it's important to characterize the difference between resources and reserves. Because reserves are something that we actually can physically reach out and touch. They're actually something that is certified. A resource is something that is conceptually understood to be in place. So when you hear about the resource assessments that have been done around shale gas and shale oil in, 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 in Mexico, those are assessments of resource, of technically recoverable resource. So this is everything we can get to regardless of cost, regardless of market price with today's technology, assuming we can actually prove that it's there. Something doesn't actually move into the category of reserve until we've reached out and touched it. Until you've drilled a well, you can actually get some pressure readings, some initial flow readings, and then you can actually assess the viability of the basin. So we're still a long way from that when we talk about shale gas and shale oil in Mexico, for the reasons I've already laid out. This is exactly why energy reform is so important, because it really is the first step towards being able to characterize that resource play fully and being able to ultimately, hopefully, realize the potential that lay, lay within. Historically, we look at oil production. This is just sort of an interesting you know, thing to lay out. We've done some work looking at the efficiency of national oil companies. And a couple of years ago, we actually released a study on uh, oil in Mexico. Uh, had a big conference down in Mexico City. It was very well received. Um, but one of the things I was involved in is actually trying to develop a forecast model. Under different types of scenarios, what would happen to you know, the oil industry in Mexico? And you've all heard stories about Mexico becoming a net oil importer in the next five years and things like that. And we were certainly able to paint that kind of a picture. It's a pretty dire picture, right? But what we were also able to do in the course of that study is lay out certain changes that would be needed, and some of them aren't that dramatic, to delay that kind of occurrence. <clears throat> so the business as usual projection, this is just sort of assuming no reform occurs and we just kind of continue down the path we're on, actually does see Mexico becoming a net oil importer sometime in the late 2020s. Now that's not a very pretty picture, particularly when oil revenues are so important to national wealth and the health of the economy. Make a few minor adjustments. Now, some of these adjustments do require capital flowing into, in particular, the offshore oil, oil sector flowing into the onshore oil sector so that you can see development, characterization of the resource, subsequent development. And you actually see that out through 2040, Mexico remains a net oil exporter. This is a much rosier picture to paint. So it's very important that something happens through the energy reform mechanism to really catalyze the flow of capital into the sector. It's not gonna come within. That was already stated and that's a very accurate statement there is a dramatic need for foreign capital to flow into the sector in Mexico. The only way that happens is through energy reform and through other mechanisms that will actually create an environment that is actually attractive to induce that capital flow. So how do we know this is true? Well, we can just look at the United States. 
we just look at oil production in the last 12 years in the United States, you can actually see dramatic change in oil production in the United States. Why is that? Well, because the regulatory overburden in the United States is not that severe. It's actually very conducive to attracting capital, to attracting entrepreneurial capital into this space. Most of the growth in oil production in the United States in the last five years, six years, has all been in the tight oil space. So what is tight oil? It's usually referred to as light tight oil, sometimes shale oil. This is oil in the United States, and it's being produced from places like the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, the Niobrara in Colorado, the Mississippi Lime up in Kansas and Oklahoma. Increasingly, people are looking at the Tuscaloosa Marine, and I saved the best one for the last, the Eagleford. The Eagleford Shale is the second largest oil-bearing shale in terms of production now in the United States. This is the same shale that extends south of the border. The potential is there. So what is the potential for change? Well, one of the things we were able to show in that study I mentioned a minute ago was that when you increase the competitive landscape, so you make the sector more competitive, you actually end up catalyzing changes in firm efficiency. So what do I mean by this? I mean, firms that are operating in the upstream space, if they're actually forced to be competitive in the space they operate in, become much more efficient in doing what they do best, which is produce oil and gas. When you look at Pemex, next to all of its peers, and I know you can't read all the names of the companies there, but there were about 70 companies we looked at. This is a summary of firm efficiency using some non-parametric techniques. I'm not going to get technical on you guys, but the idea here is you see Pemex in red there. They're pretty far down the scale. This is largely attributable to a lack of competition in the space they operate in. As you move up the scale, you start to see the level of competition typically rises. You can also, also do this in a time lapse sense, so see how it changes over time. And you can see there are companies in certain parts of the world that have been forced to move into international capital markets, some of which are national oil companies, like, well, Statoil has that legacy, but Petrobras. They've become incredibly efficient relative to their, their peers. Why? They've moved into the international capital markets, and they've had to look like their peers in order to be successful. This is the kind of thing that potentially could happen with Pemex in the wake of energy reform, and it would be incredibly beneficial to the sector in Mexico. So this I've said, uh, and it'll be my last slide, and I'll close, but really the two things that I want to sort of leave you with, the end of my remarks, that, that need to be addressed are the issues of infrastructure and safety. So energy reform, great first step. It is definitely a necessary condition, but it is not sufficient. You need to have in place the rules and regulations <clears throat> to make sure that infrastructure development can actually occur, so that capital inflow can occur in the, to the extent necessary, particularly when you're talking about shale, because again, you have to drill lots of wells to characterize the resource. If you're drilling 50 wells a year, guess what? It's just not gonna happen. It's just not going to happen. When the Barnett Shale took off, they were drilling 1,200 wells a year. That's actually how they got up the learning curve so fast. And that's a 10-year story. Now, you can do the math. Back that down to 50. How many years do you think it'll take them, for them to fully characterize that resource? Quite a few. So you really need to make sure the infrastructure is in place, and you also need to make sure that the uh, uh, issue of safety and security of the workforce is dealt with. If not, then it's just you're never going to see any success on shore. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Last but not least, uh, my partner, uh, uh, Ariel Ramos, uh, graduated from uh, Escuela Libre de Derecho and has uh, LLM from uh, UT uh, in, in 1995. He's an expert in uh, financing and development uh, energy and infrastructure projects. Uh, last year, or even before last year, uh, he participated representing uh, Brescom Indesa in the development of the financing of $4 billion loan for Etileno 21, a petrochemical plant giant with uh, Goldman Sachs and Nika. And it's one of the major projects, actually won an award uh, uh, last year uh, uh, for the International Magazine for Projects. 
Ariel also is a teacher of the Escuela Libre Derecho, has written uh, different articles, and uh, was the president for the uh, Mexican Academy of Energy Law for 2011 and 2012. Ariel, please. Thank you, Tonyo. It's great to be here, uh, and uh, it's great to see um, the attendance that we have for this event, especially with the weather, which just shows uh, a good example of the interest and importance uh, that we have in this topic. So just uh, I, I wanted to outline um, in, and, and give some uh, context to our discussion. So I'm just going to share a couple of information and, and data about the situation that's happening in Mexico. and. Uh, and, um, uh, and also, I believe that the key element uh, for uh, the reform in this case and for Mexico to understand in general, the political parties, Congress, people, everyone, is that actually Mexico is pretty late in this process. And not only that, but uh, we don't have any more time to lose. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, it's important to take into consideration that Mexico is actually competing with other countries that are actually offering better uh, conditions nowadays uh, and are more attractive for uh, all uh, EMP and service companies. So that being said, just I wanted to share a couple of important data here with you guys. Uh, the first thing is with respect to the production, the current production of uh, Mexico in terms of oil and gas. Right now we're talking at, at least in terms of oil, approximately 2.3, 2.5 million barrels a day. Uh, in terms of uh, gas, we're talking about uh, 3.7 uh, million cubic feet. So as you can see, I mean, the, the, the amount of production, if we compare it to the type of reserves that we have in terms of 1P, 2P, 3P reserves, Definitely, there is a mismatch here. So the biggest risk for, for Mexico is not, a, is not actually if we're going to end up uh, running out of oil. It's, 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 the big question is if we're actually going to be able to take out our oil and gas eventually. <clears throat> this map here basically shows a little bit of the location of the reserves of Mexico. And as you can see, uh, one of the important thing is that most of the reserves, especially for shell gas and shell oil, are located also in the region. And going back to Ken, Ken's point, which has uh, uh, a lot of issues in terms of safety, in terms of security. So uh, this is really important challenge, one of the important challenges for Mexico, how to actually provide and give sufficient safety uh, in order to allow service companies to actually be able to develop the reserves here. One important thing to, to take into consideration also is that all this region, in this case, which actually is, uh, is the main corridors for uh, drug trafficking to the U.S., uh, this specific industry uh, and an energy reform could give actually sufficient resources and possibility of work for uh, a low-income class uh, people that actually right now, they don't have an other option than to be working with the drug cartels. So this actually um, uh, represents an important, um, uh, an important option. From the reserves that Mexico has, 66% uh, are considered to be uh, developed reserves. 34% uh, are considered to be undeveloped reserves. Really important, Pemex was able actually to increase their replacement ratio of reserves in the last several years, which was one of the biggest issues for Mexico. I mean, in, 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 the, case of, in the case of Mexico, for uh, fiscal reasons, uh, it was decided um, more than a decade ago, like more than 15 years ago, that actually, the, that actually they were going to increase the production of, of oil uh, uh, in Mexico uh, to increase basically the revenue. But the problem was that this specific ratio was not actually uh, attended properly, and now it has in the last several years. From the reserves, 70% of reserves uh, uh, are considered to be oil, 61% heavy oil, 28% light oil, 11% extra light oil. I mean, the problem is that the type of reserves that Mexico has and type of oil that we have is basically heavy oil. So uh, this creates an issue. 
because at the end of the day, refining this type of oil and uh, requires more investment, requires more type of technical uh, difficulties. In the case of uh, natural gas, 60 percent is considered to be uh, associated gas, 37 percent uh, non-associated gas. And in terms of the location, 60 percent are considered to be in offshore fields and 40 percent uh, on onshore fields. This is just another presentation of, on the location of the, of the reserves. And just in terms of investment, this is a really important part of the information. Um, Mexico for, uh, and Pemex for 2012 received a record budget of more than, of approximately $24 billion. Just, just to resolve basically uh, the pending matters that they have. It is estimated today that actually uh, uh, the oil sector and more specifically Pemex requires $60 billion a year. There's no other industry in Mexico that actually can generate this kind of, of, of flow of investment and this, and, and this kind of resources. So this, is just, this just gives you an example. This is just for one year. Also, uh, this is, you know, I like this map because it shows on one hand the continuation of the Eagle Four formation, uh, uh, but also shows that the shell basins goes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And all this region, again, is, is a region where we have a lot of uh, security issues nowadays. Now, also that being said, it's interesting enough that uh, what we call in the firm the Mexican Eagle Force uh, uh, Basin uh, has actually pretty different technical and geological characteristics from the US side. One of which is that actually uh, 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 the, Eagle for, the Eagle Formation actually in the Mexican side starts actually decreasing. That's one point. And the other point is that I understand that actually the, the reserves and, uh, uh, are not actually that well connected as in the US. So in principle, what does this mean? This means that you require more investment. This means that you require more uh, drilling and more perforation than what you have in the U.S. So the big question is, well, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, of gas in the U.S., because at the end of the day, our parameter is still is, is also in Mexico, uh, Henry Hoff, if we are, uh, if, if right now in the U.S., the cost of uh, VCF is uh, $3.5 uh, dollars and the production cost is approximately 5, 5.5, then in, if in Mexico we require more investment, how are we going to justify that? How are we going to make it attractive? And talking to the, to the people from Pemex about this, you know, they, they, were, they were telling me, well, one of the things that we uh, uh, understand based on the studies is that we have a better mix of oil than shale, than, than gas on, on our shell basins. If this is true, this ba basically would be attractive enough for, for, for the companies. Also, another important point is that Mexico is not only uh, an, uh, um, uh, or has potential to become um, uh, a more uh, a gas producer, but also it's a big consumer. And this is the perspective for 2025 of consumption, just internal consumption of gas. So the market and the opportunities basically are there. This is the estimated um, uh, um, amount of resources, just uh, in the case of um, uh, of shale, um, 681 trillion cubic feet, just to give you an example. Now, just to finish, just a, a couple of comments. First, in the case of Pemex, uh, what, is, what is one of the biggest problems of Pemex? This is structure. We have a structure that basically doesn't make sense. So personally for me, of course, there's a lot of uh, criticism in terms of, of Pemex and sometimes on, on its bureaucratic way of doing things. But to be honest, these guys, these guys for me are heroes because even with this structure, even with a, a, a corporate tax rate or effective tax rate of 99.7%, these people get things done. And they have been able actually to increase the replacement ratio and get the investments done, uh, even with this kind of, these kind of issues. One of the biggest problems that this structure creates is that most of the uh, budget of, approved for Pemex, of course, goes to Pemex CMP. As, uh, as uh, Froilan and, and Luis Miguel mentioned, one of the biggest challenges for this is that they have actually 
the mandate to increase basically their, um, uh, uh, their profits. They're not gonna be able to do that with gas. So they need to focus basically in what they have and basically they're trying to focus in shallow waters and other type of reserves. That is one of the reasons why it doesn't make sense right now to actually ask Pemex to, be a, to develop these um, shell gas reserves. This doesn't mean that actually Pemex is not doing anything. Actually, right now, they are in process of awarding uh, 10 packages of contracts for uh, development of, uh, of fracking in the Burgos Basin. But what is happening is that Pemex needs to get the experience. Where are they gonna get the experience? They need to come to the US actually to start doing work. They need to, to get the experience from somewhere. I mean, one of the main differences between sh the shale market and deep water and other areas is that shale, you need to come to the US basically. The expertise is in the US. In deep water, you can go to different parts. You can go to, to the North Sea. Uh, you have the way the Brazilians have been doing it. But in the case of Shell, you have to come to the US, basically. So you have to offer better conditions uh, for that to happen. What type of contracts do we have right now? And I'm not going to enter into going into these characteristics. What I can tell you is that these kind of contracts were, were created basically as a result of the reform of 2008. Basically, these are service type of contracts. But the most important message is that this is just a good example of what we don't want. We have a type of contractual scheme today that is so different and so uh, um, uh, away, far away from the APN uh, type of format of contracts or other type of international form of contracts. So every time that we need to talk to investors and we need to explain them what these contracts are about and which conditions, let me tell you, they start to scratch their head and say, you know, what were they thinking? And it's real difficult. And if you're talking to financial institutions, because all of them are interested in getting to this market, and, you, and we start explaining them about these contracts, they just turn around and say, you know, how am I going to explain this to my credit committees? who are really used to actually uh, uh, just approve these contracts uh, and, and these projects automatically in Houston or, or somewhere else. So this is, this is basically uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, for Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. OK, uh, I got some questions for the panelists. And I would invite you also to make some comments or questions, please. Uh, let me start, and I'll, it's not directed to anybody. I just put it on the table. And uh, what would be the impact of the development of the Mexican shale reserves for Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the importation of gas from the US? Please. Okay, that, that, I, I've, I've heard that question from, from <clears throat> people that think that, that uh, shale, shale uh, play operators in the U.S. will not come to Mexico because it, it, it really doesn't make that much of a difference uh, to, to, um, to produce the gas, the, the shale gas in the U.S. and then send it to Mexico uh, rather than than going through the uh, possibly excruciating process of, of starting an operation in Mexico, go through a learning curve, uh, because right now in Mexico we don't have this, this type of, of oil field service cluster that you have in the United States. In the United States, you, 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 you make a phone call and a couple hours later you have um, a, 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 a fracking team ready to, to do fracking to a well. And that's something that, that in Mexico will need to be developed, uh, even though we, we do have companies providing fracking services. Uh, the, the issue is, is up to the market. So the market will determine uh, where these curves of supply and demand meet and, and whether it is profitable to, to start uh, an operation in Mexico or not. So. As Ariel was saying, the Mexican government has to think very hard to be competitive in terms of its fiscal regime. The way the, uh, the fiscal reform is, uh, is right now uh, an initiative to Congress, they're talking about, about a royalty of 1% for uh, wet gas and 0% for dry gas, 
with a surcharge when uh, the price of, of gas goes above $5.5 per uh, million BTU. Uh, this is something that will have to be tested in the market, whether it works for, uh, for U.S. operators or not. Um, the market will, will, will define the boundaries, but definitely what the Mexican government should be working on very hard is to attract these investors. Why? Because for Mexico, it does make a difference. If, you, if, if, you produ if companies come, operators come to Mexico and produce uh, out of the Mexican side of the Eagle Four shale, produce natural gas, there is going to be really, it's going to be a life ch uh, changing situation because you're going to provide opportunities to a sector that has been historically uh, economically depressed. Um, as, Ar as Ariel was, uh, was uh, m mentioning, uh, uh, the, the young population in, in the states of uh, Tamaulipas and northern Veracruz and Coahuila, uh, they, they don't have much choice but uh, to join uh, the organized uh, crime organizations uh, f from a very young age. And, and by, by uh, just as this had happened in the United States, by providing an alternative uh, for economic development in those areas, we would really be able to see a change in Mexico. So I, I, I believe that the government must be very proactive in, in, uh, in bringing in uh, operators to, uh, to, to drill and produce from shale formations in Mexico. Ken, would you like to add something, or Ariel as well, please? Yeah, I would actually. I mean, we've actually done some work looking at what the potential impact of developing uh, Mexico shale resources would be, and you, know, you kind of have to create a, a what-if kind of scenario um, sort of situation. Um, and it is dramatically different. Uh, what you actually see is that development is slow to progress, uh, largely because a lot of what's happened north of the border enjoys first mover advantage to the primary markets that gas would serve. Um, however, there are windows of opportunity that open up as demand grows because gas is low priced. You see industrial sector demand increasing uh, in Mexico uh, as well as in the United States. Uh, but you would also see some of the other goals that have been laid out by the Mexican government, such as you know full-fledged conversion from fuel oil to natural gas in the power sector and increased use of gas in the power sector for environmental objectives. These are all facilitated as well, and so you see demand growth. And so. Yes, it does create economic opportunity uh, in the areas immediately affected. Um, we actually see that in droves in the United States where places like North Dakota, the unemployment rate's below 3%, right? So um, it, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity uh, that we be able to you know, create a situation that actually attracts the capital. Um, but there are knock-on effects, and that's really what I was just talking about. You know, some of the environmental objectives, some of the other objectives that, that many governments, both local and state and federal for that matter, uh, might hold. They're more easily facilitated when you have a lower, uh, a fuel with a lower carbon intensity in particular and lower, you know, associated, you know, emissions such as particulates and socks and NOx and other things that come out of the fuel oils and coal, coal scenes. So, um, so there's a lot of potential uplift associated with full development. It's just a matter of how do you trigger it. So, Ariel, please. I think that uh, you make a great question because um, there has been a lot of discussion. There was a lot of discussion in the uh, last couple of years in the government saying, you know, why, why do we need to actually develop these reserves? Let's just import cheap gas from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Let's just focus more on the transportation infrastructure. And that basically shows uh, just a lack of perspective, the right perspective on this, on this point. Why? Because we have to view uh, the energy opportunities and the energy potential in Mexico on a regional basis, as, as, as Luis Miguel said. I mean, we have to view it not as Mexico. We need to view it more as North America. We need to develop a synergy with the U.S. And the only way that you can actually develop a synergy with them is if you become also a producer. And also, the importation is based on... Uh, partially false assumption, which is we're going to have cheap gas from the U.S. ever. And actually in the U.S. There's, there has been a lot big debate and a lot of pressure because the producers are producing shale gas uh, at a loss, as I, as I mentioned before. And there is a lot of, uh, uh, and there is uh, uh, intention to actually uh, uh, reconfigure 
actually the uh, utilities in the Gulf of Mexico on the U.S. side to, be, to turn them into liquef liquef uh, liquefaction facilities and start exporting, which, of course, would increase the, the, the cost of gas. Are we going to get cheaper gas than probably Japan and Europe? Yes, of course. But anyhow, I mean, the, the whole idea about that you're going to get these great deals at $3.5 dollars uh, uh, Henry Hoff, you know, BCF, that, that's definitely not going to happen in the medium term, long term, I guess. So what you need is an equilibrium, and the equilibrium, you get the equilibrium basically by becoming a producer. And as I said before, uh, Mexico is a big consumer of hydrocarbons. So you have to worry about the, the internal market. So what, that should not be the question. You need both. You need to have uh, an infrastructure on, on the gas transportation side, dual invest. That gives you the possibility of, you know, inflow and, and outflow, right. and, and and also you need the investment on the on, on the shell side. See, so we have a question over there, please. No, oh, please feel free. So, Pablo Mina from Wood Mackenzie once again. My question is about the role of Pemex in developing these unconventional resources. I mean, if Pemex really separated from this political standpoint of the government, is there really a necessity of it being producing non-associated gas? I mean, the, what's the point of doing a deep water development as La Catch, doing the second phase of Lankawasa, and doing, going through all this effort if the property is somewhere else? Uh, do you, don't you think that Pemex role should be the risk in this potential place in order to just delegate the development of the them later on? Well, it, it actually, it's not up to Pemex to delegate uh, the, the development of, 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 of natural gas. I mean, Pemex, if the reform passes the way it, it is uh, presented to Congress, uh, Pemex is going to be one more operator. So it, as uh, George was saying earlier today, uh, sometimes in Mexico we think that Petróleos Mexicanos is the Petróleo Mexicano, and, and that is not the case. So Petróleos Mexicanos is an operator. It's been a monopoly for a long time, but it's not going to be a monopoly anymore. So it's going to be a, a, perhaps a privileged operator, but it's going to be one of the many operators, hopefully. So I agree with you. It's not, it's not just the issue that, that in the port investment portfolio of Pemex, uh, uh, natural gas has been neglected in the last uh, few years. So Burgos and Veracruz, which are the, base, the big gas basins, have, have had no investment in the last five years. Uh, because Pemex wants to put all the marbles in uh, shallow waters and, and the southeast basin in the, in the Villa Hermosa area. Uh, and not only that, Pemex is, is not very efficient, except for shallow waters. Uh, Pemex, Pemex is very inefficient. If you compared how much does it cost to Pemex and how long time does it take to Pemex to drill a, um, a, a shallow, um, a, a pretty sh shallow well for uh, a shale gas, uh, it's really, uh, I mean, there is just no comparison between what is done in the U.S. And the, and the U.S. companies are going very fast through a learning curve. They're drilling uh, wells that, uh, that cost less every time, uh, they, 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 do, they, use, they use, do it in a shortest time, shorter time, and, and they, uh, and uh, uh, as Ken was saying, it, it's also very important, they, the, the, the ecological, the environmental footprint has to be reduced every time. And, uh, and, and Pem I mean, drilling five wells is not going to make it. No? Uh, uh, and and uh, so, so there are these two issues. Pemex is not interested from the economic side, but at the same time, Pemex is never going to be competitive. Uh, somebody, uh, some, I heard somebody say in Mexico uh, that, that asking Pemex to develop uh, shale gas basins is like asking an elephant to, uh, to eat with, with chopsticks, eat rice with chopsticks. No? <laughs> Any other questions? No. Uh, right can, here. I, can I actually add a comment? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, so sorry, sorry Ken. Quickly. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, uh, there's a saying, you kind of view the world from where you sit. Um, and when we talk about Pemex, I think there's a bit of that in your question to an extent. Um, because one of the things I was referring to in, in my opening remarks was what increased uh, uh, capital flows into the energy sector in Mexico would mean. It would raise the bar it would, in terms of competition. 
uh, in that sense, you would actually see, as you've seen with peer firms in the in terms of the national oil company space, right? Globally, over the over the last 15 to 25 years, those firms become more efficient out of necessity. And what you end up seeing when that occurs is those firms often go abroad. They don't just stay at home. So one of the things that could actually happen, and I would not be surprised at all if it did, if you did see an increased level of competition in Mexico, you would see Pemex actually trim down, become more efficient, expand its activities domestically, and actually go abroad, which would be Great. a completely different kind of conversation. Right. One back here. Yes. Ixchel Castro from Wood Mackenzie also. Um, a lot of the discussion has been focusing on how to unlock the potential reserves that are in Mexico. But what's going to happen with that gas once it's come out of the well? Um, you don't have infrastructure. You don't have a way of bringing that gas to the actual demand centers within their country or even back to the US. So I would like to know what's your take on, one, this infrastructure development gas processing plants, or even additional petrochemical co projects that, like brass camps. I'll take the first cut. What you just laid out is the economic case that's basically a challenge, right? Because nobody's going to produce gas that it can't sell. Um, so basically what you're laying out is, you know, a sort of longer term challenge. How do you actually see full-fledged full industrial development to create sinks, for, demand sinks for the gas that could ultimately be produced? But also, how do you make sure that infrastructure is developed adequately to handle it? And nobody's going to drill a well absent that. And that's actually one of the challenges that I laid out. And maybe I emphasize safety a little, little, little too much, but that is certainly a huge issue. Uh, and that's actually why in my other remarks that I, I indicated, um, we've done some work trying to look to see what would happen with Mexico's gas if it were allowed to be developed unimpeded and there's a major first mover advantage it has to overcome namely what's happening north of the border so it's not gonna even if, if the world changed tomorrow you wouldn't see it happen within five years you're talking about a decade out at least Ariel please I mean what has been happening in Mexico you know in terms of how we adapt and how we accept the unacceptable it's really interesting I mean, and what has been happening in terms of, of the investment is because of the situation of, of safety in the border, that doesn't mean that the investment has not gone down in Mexico. It just means that most of the industry is moving to the, the center part of Mexico. So that in principle, you know, could be good. The problem is we don't have gas in, 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 in central Mexico and we don't have, if we don't have gas, we don't have power. So we have really high power rates. So at the end of the day, it's about everything. All of this is about pr promoting and, and, and attracting investment. Now, there has been a lot of efforts. Uh, uh, Tonya was referring about the competition between Pemex and, and CFE. This is, this is for the transportation side. And uh, uh, CFE being uh, the largest consumer of, of, of natural gas in Mexico, uh, they decided they were going to take things on their own. They were not going to wait for Pemex. They knew that actually Pemex, especially the Pemex subsidiary in charge of gas, Pemex gas, they have uh, uh, less than 5% of the budget, if I remember correctly. So they don't even have sufficient resources to keep the existing national pipeline system uh, on a good shape. So CFE started developing, actually, um, uh, important pipelines to uh, assure importation of gas from the U.S., and actually they are developing this, you know, the Sonora pipelines that are, that are going to actually go down uh, uh, up to uh, Manzanillo. And on the other side, we have Los Ramones, which also, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a sad story, but it's, it's ongoing, uh, which is, uh, you know, an, an almost 900-kilometer pipeline coming from uh, Reynosa to, uh, to Aguascalientes. So, uh, you know, one way or the other, these um, uh, infrastructure issues uh, are, are, are being addressed. Of course, there, there's plenty to be done, uh, uh, but the market for the consumption of the gas is there. As, as I showed on the slide, I mean, there, there's no question about that. Actually, we have the, 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 the capability of, of consuming uh, important amounts of gas. But at the end of the day, we produce more than we consume. I mean, so be it. I mean, let's start exporting it to Japan. Let's start exporting it to Europe. I mean, this is the kind of perspective we need from, from, from the government. I mean, unfortunately, our government always have been conservative in terms of what they want to do and how they want to do it. And if they're not sure that there's a market, a market in certain things, they just don't take the decision of going there. 
And, and, and this is one of the things that, that uh, definitely needs, needs to be changed. A little bit more. We got five more minutes, but let's... Uh, well, it actually ends in one minute. But. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I just, one minute. So we'll Sorry. No, I, I, I just want to mention the fact that, that this reform is, a, is an all-encompassing reform. It also, it also includes uh, the uh, liberalization of investment for uh, transportation, distribution, and downstream activities, refining, petrochemicals. Uh, the, 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 right now, private uh, power generators have to have to sell its power to the to the Mexican uh, uh, electricity monopoly, but not anymore. They are going to compete with the CFE from now on, so they can have their own projects. They are going to uh, uh, be able to procure their own natural gas. They have to, they, they, and they be able to sell to the final uh, consumer. Uh, the, only, the, the only thing that the, the government will keep controlling is with the dispatch. But um, everything else is going to be liberalized. And, and, and if the market works, then you're going to have transportation and distribution projects that will make up for, for the infrastructure that is still required, as you mentioned. Yeah, so there's a, a break. Five now. minute break. And then, yeah, we'll, and then we'll reconvene at 11.15. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel Ken. Thank you, Luis Miguel. Thank you. Thank you.